Greetings guys, so I'm going to give you a free preview of a video from the Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics channel. A lot of you guys still haven't gone and checked it out for your free two week trial. It's only $4.49 a month for all the videos you want to watch. And basically what we're going to do in this video is we were doing a four part series on 10 commandments to know and understand so you don't burn up your PCM doing testing on computer controlled components in a car. And the video that you're about to see is actually the final part in that series. It is the final exam that I put together so that the viewers can sort of assess their knowledge on all the concepts we covered from wiring diagrams, ground side switching, using a test light, using different settings on your DVOM, all these things you're going to need to know to make sure you don't fry the PCM doing electrical component testing. The idea is this video is a good summary of most of the concepts that we covered in the four part series and the idea is if you watch the video and see that these are some concepts you would like to master then you owe it to yourself to go over to the Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics channel, the link will be right here and you will be able to watch the rest of the series for free for up to two weeks as well as all the other videos on there. The theme with this particular video is a little game that I played for the final exam called Scream at Your Screen. And basically what I do is do various electrical tests that actual viewers have done that may or may not fry your PCM. And the idea is when you see me doing these things, you might scream at your screen if you see I would be causing damage to the PCM. And that's kind of how you can assess your knowledge on the concepts. So hopefully you'll enjoy this video and it still has some education material even if you haven't seen the rest of the series and don't intend on checking out the other channel. So I hope you enjoy it and here is the video. All right, guys, it is final exam time to close out this series on how to test computer controlled components without frying the PCM. So let's see how you do. The way this format is going to work is we are going to review a circuit on the dry erase board of knowledge so that you can see the circuit design. It is obviously what you should do before you test a circuit anyway, even if you think you're familiar with it. I know sometimes I don't do that, but technically that's what you should do. So that's what we're going to start with. Then what I'm going to do is try various tests on that circuit that actual viewers have done, which may or may not fry their computer. As you know, I've got a number of viewers that have fried their computer trying to do some of the stuff because they didn't understand the concepts. We're going to see if you would have made those same mistakes. So what we're going to do is go ahead and start off with a fuel injector circuit, look at some tests that we might be inclined to do in some hypothetical situations, and you will scream at your screen if you see that I'm going to do something that would destroy the computer or the circuit. All right, on this car, and actually on most cars, by the way, this would be our fuel injector circuit. So this would be the circuit for each fuel injector. Generally, there will be a different pin on the PCM for each fuel injector. You see we have the positive going through a fuse. This symbol here, if you're not familiar, means a connector. So we basically go directly to the fuel injector, and we can see that the PCM ground side switches to close to the ground to complete the injector circuit. Whenever that switch closes, the injector fires, and the injector firing is obviously controlled by the PCM opening or closing that ground internally. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a hypothetical situation here. Let's go ahead and look in the car. And on this car, we have a misfire code, we'll say, for this cylinder, and this is the fuel injector on the cylinder. Our testing has narrowed down that we suspect that this fuel injector is not firing. For whatever reason, this is what we suspect, and we want to do some tests for that. Now, one of the things, obviously, most of you would know to maybe put a stethoscope or even your finger on the injector, feel that it's firing. Maybe even try putting 12 volts directly to the injector, see if it clicks, whatever. But what we're going to pretend is this is a situation like you'll find on many cars where the injector is not accessible because it's under the intake manifold, perhaps. So we need to do our testing basically from the connector. 
So let's open up with uh, what one viewer did one time. And we're going to go ahead and remove this harness here. And what we're going to do is this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my DVOM here. I'm going to set it on to the 20 volt mode. And we'll set that here so that there's no glare on it, I hope. And then what I am going to do is I'm going to take this paper clip and I'm going to go ahead and insert the paper clip and jump the negative and positive terminals. We can see there's a red wire and green wire for the negative and positive. I'm going to take my positive lead and I'm going to put it over here onto the positive side. And I'm going to take my negative lead and put it over on the negative side. And then I'm going to go ahead and start the engine and look to see that I've got 12 volts, confirming that there is at least voltage at this harness. All right, I am hoping that you screamed at your screen pretty much the instant I brought that paper clip out because there really was nothing else that I would possibly do with it other than jump those terminals. That obviously would fry your PCM. We'll look at why, but unfortunately this is not a joke. This is actually something that a viewer did and of course they did fry their PCM. If you are not sure why that would fry the PCM or if you're not sure why that would be a really bad idea, honestly, you are going to want to stop this video. There's no point going forward. You're going to want to get your basic electrical down. But just in case, let's just go ahead and review real quick why this is just a blatantly horrible idea. All right, so what we did here is we went ahead and we disconnected the connector and we took a paper clip and we jumped these two connectors. As you can see, this violates our cardinal principle rule. We send 12 volts directly to the PCM with no load in between. Now, even though our DVOM is in volts mode, which we know is generally safe, the trouble is, is that it doesn't matter that we hooked it up onto that paper clip. The electricity is going to go right through the paper clip. We're not going to read anything on the DVOM because there's 12 volts all along the paper clip. There's 12 volts all along the entire path. So what the deal is here is these people just have no idea how to use a DVOM and they're just way over their heads. Hopefully you see that. If you do, then good, we can move on. And again, if you don't see that, then um, I don't know what to tell you. But let's go ahead and do this a different way. Okay, let's get that paper clip out of there because that is just stupid. And what we're going to do is actually, instead of checking for voltage here, we're going to just go ahead and see if there's amperage, which is just as good, right? If we have electrical current through this circuit, then we know that we must have voltage, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to amps mode here. We are then going to go over to the 10 amp scale, and we're going to go ahead and see if we have any current through this connector, which would of course indicate that we must have at least power to the connector. So I'm going to go ahead and touch my leads, and I'm going to go ahead and start the car and verify that we get pulses of current here. All right, admittedly, a lot of people may see that as actually a rather clever idea and a different twist on the voltage test. The fact is, when we start the car, we would blow the PCM in this situation. Let's review why. All right, so if we review this incident, yes, we will indeed send current through the DVOM, and it will absolutely be measured. But the problem is, remember, a DVM in amps mode does not have a load in it. So we violate that cardinal rule. This current is going to go through the DVOM without any load. We are going to send 12 volts directly to the PCM. It is actually no different than that paper clip that we did earlier. This would fry the PCM. We might get a measurement just before the PCM blows, but that will fry the PCM when we start the car. And as soon as that's switch closes, we're going to probably hear the PCM fry. Okay, let's go ahead and do what yet another viewer suggested doing. Um, let's go ahead and put this back to volts mode. And let's go ahead and put this on the 20 volt scale. And I'm just going to go ahead and feed a couple of little extensions into this harness here so I can hook up the DVOM. I'm going to go ahead and hook uh, one end up to the positive wire. 
the other end up to the negative, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start the car, and I'm going to see if I read 12 volts at that connector. All right, that is an acceptable method because we are jumping the connector with a load. Remember, your DVOM in volts mode presents a massive load that is certainly not going to fry the PCM. It's actually more load than the injector, so it's actually safer than the injector. So what we're going to do, let's go ahead and just review that real quick, and then we'll actually go ahead and start the car. We'll see what it looks like. All right, don't worry, these tests are going to get harder, but we just want to make sure that if you're having trouble thus far, that, you know, the, the point of this is just to let you know where you stand so that you can be sure. Also, as you'll notice, sometimes it's a whole different thing looking on the wiring cartoon than it is on the actual car in real life. This is something that you will definitely discover when you start doing more of this, is actually looking on the car is often a whole different experience than looking on this. But in this case, we've got the DVOM in voltage mode. This presents a very significant load, a very significant resistance. So when this current goes through the DVOM and the DVOM measures 12 volts, and we may not actually see it on this test, we'll see. But basically, because we have the DVOM as a load completing the circuit, we will be safe. So we did review that using your voltmeter in DVOM mode. Almost always, this is going to be safe. Let's actually go ahead and start the car and see what reading we get. All right, so as you can see, that did actually work. And we confirmed that there is power to the injector. So we've got a big step in our troubleshooting. But did you notice that we did not get 12 volts at that injector? As a matter of fact, initially, we read what I expected, which was 6 volts. Remember, your DVOM takes an average of readings, and it only does it a few times a second. So if you have a DVOM that's a little bit slow, or maybe if that was a four-cylinder car where those events are going to happen much faster, you would see that average, the average of 0 volts and 12 volts, and that would be, of course, around 6 volts, the DVOM would reflect that. So you might accidentally misdiagnose that you have too low of voltage. That's not the case. You're just reading the average. You saw we ended up reading the average closer to 9 volts because the injector is on slightly more than it's off, and that would especially be the case with a cold engine start like that because the pulse length is a little longer. But we see that that did work. Let's try another test. All right, in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we measured our voltage at this connector, but we still seem to not be able to get that injector to fire. And we're thinking, yeah, there may be a bad injector, but another possible explanation is maybe we have voltage drop on this wire, and maybe we're actually getting 12 volts, but we're not getting the correct amount of current to the injector. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this test is I am going to take this jumper wire and I am going to go from the negative in the harness to the negative on the fuel injector. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the positive from my meter and I'm going to feed it into the positive in the harness. The other end of my meter, I'm going to connect to the positive on my fuel injector. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put my meter to the 10 amp scale, and we're going to go to 10 amps DC. And the idea is I'm going to go ahead and start the engine, and I'm going to go ahead and look to verify that there is the correct amount of amperage going to that injector. All right, did you scream at your screen? You probably thought that's the dumbest thing you ever saw. We've got both the jumper wire and we've got another jumper wire with the DVOM set in amperage mode. So clearly, this is an idiotic thing to do. Actually, it's not. A viewer actually suggested doing this because he suspected this exact problem. It is actually a very clever, brilliant method that shows a clear understanding of electrical. Let's go ahead and show why this is acceptable. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and start the car right now and prove it first. 
All right, and I don't know if you noticed the difference too, but there was also obviously no misfire that time because the injector is firing. So what we did in this case is we have the amp meter in series with the positive. So if we follow our current flow, we go through the amp meter again through a fuse so there's no load with the DVOM, but that's okay because there is load with the injector since the injector is still in the circuit. We have load with the injector. We did jump that ground, but that's okay because it's no different than if this was a single wire anyway, and we go to the PCM. Basically, there's no difference from the regular operation of the circuit, except that we're passing through the DVOM so we can measure the amperage. You'll notice the only problem we had, again, we experienced that average phenomenon. So the actual amount of amperage that we measured was much lower because of that averaging effect, but it did work. If we had a scope or a faster DVOM, we might have been able to have a more successful test. But the bottom line is, as far as the theory, the viewer was dead on the money. It was a great idea. It's a valid test. Let's try one more. All right, in this scenario, we have a completely opposite situation. In this scenario, what we have is a suspicion that we do not have voltage at this connector. So here's actually what we're going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and first of all, I'm going to double check here. We're going to go into voltage mode. So I'm on the 20 volt scale. I'm going to feed one lead into the positive of the harness and then the other lead I'm going to touch to battery ground. I'm going to have the ignition switch on and I'm going to look for 12 volts. All right, hopefully you would know that this would be not only a safe test, but also really the only valid test if the engine's not running. Many of you would think, why not put this to the negative on the harness? Well, the reason is, remember, that we're only going to get 12 volts when the fuel injector is called for by the PCM. If we're just on the on position, based on our diagram, we should see 12 volts at all times with ignition on, on the hot wire here, and that's why we can test it at the battery negative. If we were to put it to the negative, we would read no voltage because on the on position, of course, we're not going to have the PCM activating the injector by closing the ground switch. So I'm going to go ahead and put this to the ground and touching the ground, we see we have nothing. This is confirmation that we do not have 12 volts to this connector. Okay, so now in our situation, we've got a little bit of a concern. And what we want to do is we want to see, is this only a problem with this harness? Maybe the fuse is blown or something? Or is there something downstream where this injector is not firing and it's causing some kind of problem? So here's what I want to do to determine that the only problem we have is on this harness. I'm going to take a jumper wire, and I'm going to go from the negative on the harness here to the negative on the fuel injector. Then I have another jumper wire. One end of this jumper wire is connected directly to battery positive. The other end I'm just going to connect directly to the positive on the fuel injector. So now my plan is to go ahead and start the car and I'm either going to look and see if my misfires go away. Maybe I can look on a scan tool see that the misfires go away. But this is my idea. Let's go to the dry erase board of knowledge in case you didn't follow that and see why this would be a fantastic idea to verify everything else in the circuit works except for that positive feed. All right, so in this scenario, what we did was we have the fuel injector disconnected. We jumped the negative to complete the negative. And then what we did was we just took a jumper wire from the battery positive directly to the injector. So basically what we did was we bypassed the injector positive feed. Remember, we're doing this because there is not 12 volts that we measure at the end of this positive feed. If we do this setup and the misfires go away, then we have confirmed that the rest of the system, the injector must be good, our feed to ground must be good, our PCM must be good. If this works properly, we know our situation must be with that positive feed because we just only did what the positive feed would do anyway. 
The only arguable thing is maybe it might be a good idea to put a fuse in the wire. But even then, the worst that's going to happen is we'll probably just fry the jumper wire if everything else in this circuit works fine. If anything else in the circuit was damaged, we're not going to cause it actually by not having the fuse there. But having the fuse might be a good idea. An even better way might be to use your DVOM in amperage mode as this jumper wire so you can also verify the amperage delivery. But either way, if this works, then we know there must be some open, maybe the fuse is blown, but we have some problem with the feed here. This is a perfectly safe method because we're doing what this positive feed would already do anyway. All right, how are you doing so far? If you didn't get thrown off on any of these so far, then you're in really good shape and your aptitude to confidently do computer testing is probably just fine. If you are struggling along with these, especially in some of the early tests, then you just got to be honest with yourself. You'll need more basic whole electrical testing if you're going to do PCM testing and confidently not fry your PCM. But let's go ahead and move on to another whole system altogether, one that's maybe a little more complicated than just the fuel injector system. So for this example, we have another viewer provided contribution to this compendium of electrical knowledge. And in this case, the viewer has a mass airflow sensor diagnostic trouble code. On the scan tool, he pulls up math data, finds that the math just reads dead zero uh, with the engine running, with the key on. It doesn't matter any throttle position at all. Anything he does, he cannot get the math sensor to show anything on the scan tool. So he suspects a math sensor problem. So this is what he does. We can see a pink wire, a black wire, and a yellow wire. So it's three wire math sensor. He's assuming uh, that the pink wire obviously must be a 12 volt for the math hot wire heater because it's first of all pink and second of all it's a little thicker than the other wires. So here's what he does. He takes a regular incandescent test light and he puts one end to the battery negative. The other end of the test light, he touches to the pink wire in the harness at the terminal. And when he touches it, the test light does not light. And he concludes that there must be no power to the math sensor. What do you think? All right, admittedly a little bit debatable on this one, but the fact is it's a perfectly safe method and actually he did the right thing and came to the right conclusion. The only problem with this method is the assumption part of assuming that the pink wire was the power wire. Even though he's using the test light, which is a relatively safe method, unless you're really sure of the circuit design, this actually wasn't as safe as using the voltmeter because he can still pass some current through that test light if that circuit were active and you may possibly do some damage. So let's do this, which is actually what he did after he talked to me and found this situation. Let's go ahead and look at a schematic and then he came up with some other ideas. So this is the actual schematic for the system that the viewer was working on that he actually sent to me. And he asked me if his next idea would be a good idea because he thought that it probably would. So I'm going to go ahead and let you take a look at the schematic. You can go ahead and pause your screen to familiarize it. And then I'll tell you what his idea was. So the first thing the viewer did is he wanted to find out if the reason there's not 12 volts on the power feed, is it because there is a short to ground or is there an open? So in order to determine if there is a short to ground, this is what he does. He sets his voltmeter to continuity mode. And he takes one of his leads from his DVOM and puts it to battery negative. The other lead, he goes ahead and he touches to the terminal for the pink wire in the connector. And he looks and he sees that there is no continuity confirming that there must be an open. All right, as we described, this is a perfectly safe and valid test because we do not have power to this circuit. It would be wise to do this with the key off just in case it was a short to ground that by moving the wire around, we don't remove that short to ground and cause intermittent power to the circuit. There's even another way we could have done this. 
Since the viewer had a test light, we could have also put the test light to battery positive and then feed the test light. If the light lights up, we know there's a ground. It would confirm a short to ground. But because we know we don't have a short to ground, we know we have an open, then we can go on to the viewer's next idea. His idea was to go ahead, plug in the sensor, and then back probe that pink wire. He then takes his DVOM and sets it to 10 amp DC mode. He connects one lead to battery positive. He connects the other lead to the back probe. He turns the key to on and then looks at his scan tool. The idea is he's going to feed battery positive directly to the math sensor. And if he starts reading stuff on his scan tool, he's going to assume that everything on the math sensor circuit works, including the PCM. And his only problem must be an open in that pink wire feeding 12 volts to the math sensor. What do you think? All right, that's the final test on the exam, and it's worth more points than all the other ones combined. If you said that this guy blew his PCM, well, you might have a little more work to do, even if you got all the other things right. If you looked at that and said, damn, that guy's a genius. Why is he even asking you for help? You would be exactly right. It is an incredibly clever idea. It is a fantastic way to rule out all the variables and prove that his only concern isn't open with the power feed. Let's go ahead and take a look at the schematic just in case you didn't follow along with that, and then we'll close out the video. But first, did we forget something? It's the little mistakes like that that are going to end up costing you. All right, let's go ahead and look at the schematic. And one of the first things we would need to know is actually some basic background on the operation of the math sensor, because it actually isn't very well indicated on this diagram. Luckily, the guy did actually watch my video on diagnosis and understanding of math sensors, and it's actually where he came up with all of these ideas. He was correct about all of the tests that he was doing. So the first thing is if we look at the circuit, and usually it's best to actually start from your device. So let's start from the device. We see our pink wire here. When we follow our pink wire, we see it goes through a fuse directly to battery voltage. We know this is battery voltage for a couple reasons. Even though it doesn't say 12 volts here, it does have a fuse and it's 20 amps. That is obviously going to be 12 volts. So we do have a 12 volt feed to the mass airflow sensor. If you understand the mass airflow sensor, this is going to be the hot wire. So I'm making a little coil there. This is the heated wire for the hot wire math. It doesn't show it on the diagram, but again, sometimes you've got to do some research and understand how this works. When he unplugged the sensor, we see the connector here. He did not see 12 volts, even with the key on. If we look with the key on, and certainly with the engine running for sure, we should have 12 volts at that wire. He did not see it. His question is all the rest of this circuit working. So if we look at the rest of the circuit, we see it's very simple. There was a black wire and a yellow wire. The black wire is just the ground. And he could have used his test light or a DVOM to test at the ground, but he's actually killing two birds with one stone with his idea. The other thing is the yellow wire is a math sensor signal. If the math is working and the hot wire is working, then changes in the mass airflow will be sent to the PCM, and he'll see that on his scan tool. Of course, his scan tool reads zero because there's no 12 volts, the hot wire is not active, there's no change with the mass airflow detected because the wire isn't working. What he did was he just went directly from the battery to the connector to manually feed 12 volts and somewhat force it through the sensor. This is exactly what the normal wiring does, except he doesn't have a fuse this time. Again, it might be a good idea to use a fuse, but it's not really that big of a deal in this case. When he did that, the hot wire did work. He was able to see results on the scan tool. What did that tell him? It tells him that everything, including the ground for the wire, the signal, the PCM, 
everything works. His problem is he had to have had an open with the 12 volt feed to the math sensor. Absolutely brilliant troubleshooting. Well, I hope you guys blew away your final exam and that it was actually relatively intuitive and things make a lot more sense to you now. But a final couple of comments here. First of all, this is actually really one of the most important things to focus and spend time on. So if you're still struggling with the basic electric, then you know let me know and I'll do some videos that will also help you get you caught up. But I can't overemphasize that it is this material that we are covering combined with the testing at the computer and some other things that really are going to make you a good diagnostician. It's not going to be the scan tool. The problem is, is that no matter how you look at it, eventually, even if you're quite the wizard with the scan tool, the best that's going to happen is it's going to narrow and point to a component where you will have to do some of this testing. There is no way around it. The scan tool alone probably is not going to help you, especially as a do-it-yourselfer, because you're probably not going to have the bi-directional controls. So you have no way around it. You'll have to learn this stuff. The other thing is that it's knowing this stuff that is really going to differentiate you even from the 2%. You look at any other YouTube video, you look at any chat room or anything like that, and only a very tiny few of them will cover material like this. So if you can do stuff like this, you are going to be in fairly high demand. Whether you do this as a hobby or whether you do this professionally, the number of people that can do this kind of stuff and understand it, it's very, very few. So it's well worth your time to try to understand this stuff and become proficient with it. And the final thing that I wanted to bring up is to make sure that you're getting the right sort of lesson or moral to this whole series. And that is to not look at this and start making a list of your top 10 things and then having that right with you so that when you're doing some type of electrical testing, you're looking for the particular 10 commandment or the particular video I did that did the exact same thing. That's not what you want to do with this. As a matter of fact, you almost won't be able to do that because every situation you run into is going to be different. The idea is not to sort of play color by numbers and match what you're doing with some video out there. The idea is to understand this as a whole to the point where you can look at a system and instead of thinking which is the best method to do this, you'll just come up with your own method to do it based on your fundamental understanding. That's the level you want to get to. You've often heard me use the term methodological as opposed to methodical. Following what I showed here is a methodical approach. But taking what you've learned and then coming up to a situation and saying to yourself, you know, one way I could test this would be if I jump this and put power to that and then look for a change in resistance here. That would be a way I could look at the circuit. That is methodological. Methodological is designing your own methodical approach. That's where you want to get at. But you're only going to get that if you actually do this stuff. You can watch videos all day. You can even kind of understand it and follow along. But until you do some of this stuff on an actual car, you're never going to actually be able to do it. All right, well, that concludes this series. I hope you enjoyed it and found it very helpful. So what's coming up next is a couple of ideas. Uh, we've got a couple of good diagnosis videos, I think, that we're only going to put on this channel. But one of the main things that I'm hoping to get some of your feedback on, I plan on doing a multi-part series on basic scan tool strategy and operation, basically how to use a scan tool. This will also cover for many of you guys who don't have a scan tool but you're thinking of buying one. We'll even start from the beginning with some features features that you definitely want and how to select a scan tool. So basically designed for a lot of you guys that you're ready to get a scan tool or you have one and you're just not really proficient at using it yet. It's going to be geared for you guys. So that's also coming up. I'd like your feedback on if that's going to fit, but I'm kind of putting together that for a lot of you guys that series might be helpful. Again, I need your feedback so that I know what custom productions to put on this channel for you. So that's it again. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. At the time of release of this video, happy Thanksgiving to you guys, and we'll catch you next time.